Okay. Let's uh, talk about current symmetry breaking and its role in QCD and Hadron physics. Um, so that's uh, the definition, the characteristic of a structure that makes it impossible to superimpose it on its mirror image. So, uh, you know, people knew about chirality for a long time ago in, in molecules. And there is an interesting saying that any man who, upon looking down at his bare feet, doesn't laugh, has either no sense of symmetry or no sense of humor. <laughs> so these are chiral objects because they cannot be superimposed, this on this and this on this. And these are non-chiral objects which can be imposed. Okay. So we will uh, start talking about QCD and, and chiral symmetry and its, uh, and its uh, eventual dynamical breakdown. So chiral symmetry of QCD and the manner in which it is broken, we will see that has far reaching consequences for hadron spectroscopy and understanding the internal dynamics of, of, of hadrons. This is particularly important for the light quarks. Why is it particularly important for the light quarks? Because uh, um, um, the masses which are uh, generated dynamically for the heavier quarks are, are small as compared to the ones that they already have in the Lagrangian, and therefore they, their role becomes, becomes different. Okay. So uh, let's, to start with, only look at up and down quarks, because a lot of the systems that we will see are made of only up and down quarks. Our atoms are made of protons and neutrons, and they only have up and down quarks. The physics of the luminous universe uh, uh, depends a lot on up and down quarks. So, uh, so the covariant derivative here will be uh, defined as such, and we will have this uh, tau A's are the Pauli matrices because we are talking about SU2. Now, we will assume that the up and down quarks are either very small, that they can be neglected as compared to any other momentum or mass scale that we have in the problem or we'll simply put them equal to zero and then study and then see how we take them different from zero or how they can be generated. So this is the Lagrangian in the absence of, uh, of M, U, and MD masses. Okay. Now we can define what I call the right and left spinner. Okay. You probably have uh, already seen these. Uh, so in the absence of these masses, these uh, left chirality spinner and the right chirality spinner are basically the same thing as the handedness or the helicity of, of, of a particle. Okay? The helicity of the particle we define as the projection of the spin in the direction of motion of the particle, uh, which is not really a Lorentz invariant quantity, however the chirality is, but in the limit of the masses being zero or at high energies, these two things become the same. So left and right sector of the Lagrangian is, is, uh, is, is then separated. So if we write, define this psi L and psi R, this uh, Lagrangian we can uh, define in terms of left-handed and, and, and right-handed uh, spinners. Then we can see, for example, this, this Lagrangian is invariant under this transformation U1R cross U1 right. right? because these are separated. Although this uh, um, transformation for the left uses a different parameter theta L and for the right, a different parameter theta R, but because the Lagrangians, uh, the part of the Lagrangians for the left and right have completely been separated, uh, these are, are symmetries and you can calculate the, uh, um, cu the currents which are conserved corresponding to these right and left transformations. You can also convert it into a different set of transformation in which you add these currents, which are now called the vector current, and this is called the axial vector current. And, 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 and these V mu and A mu are, are like this as compared to the left and right. So you can talk about one or the other uh, uh, set of uh, transformations. So you can either have uh, this transformation, or you can have this transformation. This is vector and axial vector transformation, and this is left and right transformation. So either we can talk in one, in terms of one or in the other. Now, what happens if you introduce uh, 
a mass term. And I'll say that isospin invariant mass term in which I'm assuming that the up quark mass is the same as the down quark mass. Okay. So now that causes a, 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 lot, a lot of havoc. What does it? Hmm. This is not the coffee. What was my coffee? Is it my coffee? And she's not here anyway. So, so, so when you introduce the mass term, you see that this mass term, this right and left uh, spinners intermingle. Okay. Again, you can you know, rewrite that in terms of vector and axial vector, and the vector transformation is still conserved, but the axial vector transformation uh, uh, is not a, a, a symmetry anymore of the Lagrangian. So you can have this equal to zero, but the, 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 the but not, not for the axial vector, it's not a conserved current. So this symmetry, when mass is not equal to zero, this symmetry will reduce to only vector symmetry because other symmetry gets broken. So let's uh, uh, start from um, the massless Lagrangian again, but instead of having as a U1 transformation, let, let us look at the SU2 transformations. So first year we can start from the left or right transformation, but now we, we have the spinner up and down uh, here. So uh, um, these tower the Pauli, Pauli matrices and the Lagrangian remains invariant because of course we have the sectors right and left which are decoupled from, from each other. And we have the correspondingly right and left conserved currents. Again, we can make linear combinations, we can have a vector and axial vector currents, and we can have vector and axial vector transformation, and the mass term again breaks chiral or, or axial symmetry. Okay. So you can introduce again this isospin invariant mass term, and what we see is that for the axial transformation, uh, you do not get back the mass term, but you have an additional mass term which will uh, uh, have these uh, uh, transformation parameters. Okay, so this is because the mass term mixes the, the chiral partners. As long as masses are small as compared to a relevant mass scale, the symmetry is almost or partially conserved. U and D masses are supposed to be very small as compared to lambda QCD, and we see that this symmetry is almost conserved. Nambu and Jonah Lesinia proposed in 1960 that chiral symmetry of massless QCD is broken uh, dynamically. In fact, although I haven't mentioned it, yes. They will come out of this. Uh, we have not broken it dynamically yet. Okay? Yeah, we are talking talking about the little mass term in the Lagrangian, there is or there isn't. I will come back to this thing. But when I, you know, there are two kinds of symmetry breaking for the uh, up and down quark masses, well, others as well takes places. One is that you can have in the original Lagrangian, you have the masses, which we can call the bare masses. The bare masses, are, of course, are infinite. Then you can, when you renormalize them, those masses are called the current quark masses. Okay. So the current quark masses, which are there already in the Lagrangian, which are like 5 MeV or 6 MeV, these are what we call cause the explicit breaking of chiral symmetry. And this happens through the Higgs mechanism because these masses are generated through the interaction of quarks with the Higgs field. Okay. Then there is a, a chiral symmetry breaking which, which creates pions and kaons and pseudoscalar mesons of the ground state. And that happens even if we have uh, the bare masses or the current masses in the Lagrangian zero. And those will be the one which will um, give birth to, to these goldstone bottles. So I was talking about this number, uh, Jonah Lesenio. Um, uh, I, I don't, somehow I didn't put the transparency there or slide there, but I think I would like to mention that they wrote this paper in 1960. Uh, I think this uh, paper was written even before the work of Gelman on, on quarks. And, and Nambu writes this paper, and this is a wonderful paper that we read it abstract, and he says, where did this proton mass comes from? We believe there should be a fundamental uh, spin half field, which will be breaking chiral symmetry and giving mass to the proton. Uh, there was no such field known at that time. 
<laughs> so they were trying to see what possibly could be doing it. Okay? But he gave this moral without even knowing it. So he was talking about the field which was which still Galman had not proposed, which was not seen in the experiment, but there it was Nambu talking about chiral symmetry breaking and the generation of proton mass. It was an absolutely lovely paper. And in this is one of the greatest papers. And in fact, I, I, do, I don't remember, but there is a very famous scientist who told at some point that I decided to work with Nambu because I was told that Nambu can be 10 years ahead of all other scientists in the field. And I said, okay, so I want to be ahead of them. I want to go and work and do my PhD with Nambu. I go to Nambu, ask him for a problem. And Nambu suggests me a problem. I go home and think about a problem. And I absolutely have no clue what he's suggesting. So I kept thinking and kept thinking. And when I really understood, 10 years had passed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it was not really very useful. So this is an, it's an absolutely wonderful the paper by Nambu and, and Jonathan Sid. So though the massless Lagrangian remains uh, invariant, uh, vacuum is not due to QCD strong interaction. So even if you have zero masses, you can, uh, the QCD itself can, can, can generate masses through its strong interactions. And that's the whole beauty of quantum chromodynamics. And there is a, a non-zero condensate gets me formed, a non-zero condensate because, you know, um, uh, the Lagrangian, sorry, the vacuum cannot have the, uh, vacuum has to, any condensate has to have the, the properties of the vacuum, and therefore you have to have a scalar field here whose condensate is not zero, but psi is a fermion field, so you can make a, a, a scalar like this, and that is the, the condensate which, which generates. And the vacuum can mix the light quark chiralities, and this allows U and D quarks to acquire masses when they travel through the QCD vacuum, that is quark anti-quark uh, 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 inside a, a bound states, inside nucleon, inside pion, there is a generation of a, of a condensate. That's a bit of a controversial issue as well. Thus, inside the bound state, the UND quarks would require a large dress mass even when they have zero mass in the Lagrangian. Okay. So that's. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you can you can extend it to SU as as SU as SU three as well. Yeah, but yeah, strange quark mass will be a, a bit more different. So therefore, um, uh, this isospin or the flavor symmetry will not be exact anymore, but less less and less exact. So this is the picture that I had I had uh, uh, taken from an article written by Mike Pennington, and it is called uh, "Swimming with Quarks." And I think there was a documentary, Swimming with Sharks, and that's from where he had taken this title, Swimming with Quarks. So those, those are our, our quarks, and, and he draws this picture in, in the coordinate space, and that happens is uh, that uh, somehow when, when the distances between uh, the quarks are smaller, they are like asymptotically free. You see, when they're very close to each other in distance space, they, they're, they're, they're almost free. But when they start separating from each other and traverse uh, the, the distances of, of the size of a, a normal hadron, not the Goldstone boson, they acquire large effective mass. And this, this mass scale is going to be of the order of, of, of 300, 300 MeV. So this is somehow we understand the mechanism, how chiral symmetry is, is, is broken uh, for quarks. This is uh, like the mass function that, that, that I, I had told before. I haven't shown it for QCD, but this is for QCD. But instead of uh, writing the same mass as a function of momentum, in this picture, he has drawn it as a function of distance, okay? Distance between the quarks. Okay, a typical meson like a rho meson has a mass of 770 MeV, while a nucleon has a mass of 940 MeV. So this is more or less consistent with, with an approximate constituent, or I would say, in our case, dressed quark mass of around 300 MeV, because the double of 300 is around that 770, this is 940. However, pions only weigh about 140 MeV that you talked about. 
and that is about one fifth of the mass of the rho. They are particularly light because they're Goldstone bosons. They come from a mechanism which is slightly different. So the dynamical breakdown of chiral symmetry is, is generated by this. And in fact, it gives rise to three massless gold bosons. I will not go into the details of the, uh, of the theorem and how these are generated for each broken generator because I don't have time and I, I took a different route to come here. So pion are the lightest of hadrons. They do not have exact zero mass due to explicit symmetry, chiral symmetry breaking. If, if there were no masses in the Lagrangian for up and down masses, if there were no masses due to Higgs breaking of the symmetry, then, uh, then the pions would be massless. But pions have a slight mass. Usually if, that, if, if this dynamical breaking or spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry breaking for zero masses, for a global symmetry gives you goldstone bosons which are massless and appear in the spectrum okay this is slightly different from um uh um for a uh, for a for a local symmetry like gauge symmetry when we break from the standard model you also have uh, um uh, these uh, goldstone bosons but they are eaten up by the gauge bosons and they don't appear in the spectrum they become the longitudinal component of your weak gauge bosons. But in this case, uh, it's a global symmetry uh, and it appears as, as in the spectrum, the three pions uh, correspond to the three broken generators of, of chiral symmetry. I'll, I'll, I like this, uh, this diagram. I had given once a course, which is on, on the quark model. And uh, then um, I had uh, using these puzzle pieces for all the pions and the mesons and using the puzzle that one of you know my son had 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 made himself but um so this is the idea the three broken generators give rise to three pions which are observed observed in 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 in, in nature uh the par, uh, pi plus pi zero and and pi minus and they are created by axial isospin current whose relevant max, matrix element can be parametrized as uh, as follows where f pi is the pion leptonic decay constant and and uh, because of symmetry because of the dynamical breaking of chiral symmetry there is a particular relation which comes about and i haven't gone into the details of this of course in which for the first you can see that m pi squared is is proportional to the masses uh, the current masses of the lagrangian and it is also proportional to the condensate, which is, you know, which we expect that is dynamically broken leads to the value of a condensate. And there is a, there's a pion K constant. Now, there are two sources of chiral symmetry breaking, and we are mentioning explicit and dynamical. In the absence of explicit chiral symmetry breaking, MU and MD will be zero, and the pion mass will be strictly zero, as it should be, for it is a Goldstone boson. But we have uh, the situation where we have an explicit chiral symmetry breaking in the Lagrangian, and therefore this thing happens. And there is a particular formula, particular uh, um, thing to watch that m pi square comes out to be proportional to mass. It's not a linear relationship, and that uh, is is uh, very particular the way this symmetry is dynamically broken. That your Goldstone boson, which are pseudoscalar mesons their square mass is proportional to the linear mass. And that relationship you can see even in lattice calculations and other calculations, this quadratic uh, dependence. I had a very nice graph. There were two graphs, but I somehow in the end forgot to, forgot to put them. So, um, so chiral symmetry and its, its, its breakdown. Let me, let me come a little bit to, uh, um, you know, we are talking about quarks and, and, and up and down quarks and all this, and, and just barely started about the, uh, talking about the, the bound states. What I want to see is that how do we observe that in the physical world? Because we don't see in the physical world quarks and, and, and gluons, okay? So one other thing you see how pion and rho and several other mesons transform under chiral transformations. So that's not not a not a straightforward thing to see, but knowing the property of the pion, its um, parity property, but it's a pseudoscalar meson, and also uh, um, um, it's of course it's a uh, it's it's a Lorentz uh, scalar, not a vector. Rho is a is a vector particle, 
and and uh, um, uh, its its parity is minus. Therefore, if we imagine, uh, if we go back, say, like to a type of a quark model in which we have our mesons only made of quark and an anti-quark. Uh, uh, we can mm, write down effective Lagrangians in which I can represent pion as a, a, as a bound state of quark and anti-quark fields. And this gamma five takes into uh, account the parity of the pion, and uh, uh, and of course this is this is the this is the uh, uh, isospin part. And this, of course, is the vector which corresponds to 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 the row. And then you have also for the so the vector sign indicates the isovector nature of the particle. The mu index is the Lorentz index. Then you can also have not the pseudo-scalar particles. You can have the scalar particles, which of course would have a different parity. And there is uh, the psi bar psi, and this is represented by you know there are uh, axial vectors, and and we will see that we will talk about them really how they play a role in 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 hadron physics. Now we have seen the axial these. Uh, transformations, which are vector or axial vector or left or right transformations for these fields. And if we write these bound state as these fields, how would they transform? Because I can always transform this, this quark field as a left, right. How will it affect the transformation for the pion? Okay. And, and, and what does it tell us about, uh, about their, their presence in the, in the spectrum of hadrons that we observe? So if this is a pion field, I can go ahead and see what, what happens if I do this, this uh, uh, vector transformation on it, on, on the quark field. So again, I'll not go into this. So I do this vector trans transformation. I assume that my theta is so small that theta squared and higher powers can be neglected. And therefore, I only have the terms which are up to linear. This uh, gives me back the pion. And then uh, this thing, of course, I, I can use the commutation relationship. And then I see that, that this new uh, field in, in this direction is also the same field, the pion field. So it's like that I'm the same pion, I'm, I'm rota rotating it in the isospin uh, uh, space. Now what happens, mm, uh, so this is the SUV v transformations. If I uh, do it on the row particle, you will see as this, this color, as you know, is a homework. So those people who are storing it for longer weeks here, they have more time to do this homework and I will be pestering you all the time. Um, so this is also gives you back the row particle. So these transformations are identified with isospin rotations and the conserved vector current with the isospin current. Now what happens, um, um, if I do the axial vector transformation. So this is uh, how the psi field transform for theta small and the psi bar field. And now I apply it to what a pion would look like as a bound state of a quark and an anti-quark, okay? So I apply this transformation. Now it's not a negative sign. So this is an anti-commutator there. An anti-commutator of, of this is proportional to delta ij, okay? And I put delta ij here, and, uh, and this gamma 5 squared then will give me 1, and I get this particle. So but this is what was the property of a scalar particle, which I call the sigma particle, which is not exactly a quark-anti-quark -quark state in the physical spectrum. But somehow, when I do the axial transformation, a pion seems to get transformed into a sigma. A pseudo-scalar particle seems to transform into a scalar particle, and if I do, uh, uh, yeah, and if I do the same thing on the vector particle like a row, it seems to transform into an axial vector. So it means that uh, if I talk about the bound state of a quark and an anti-quark under axial transformation, uh, a vector particle gets converted into an axial vector and a pseudo-scalar to a scalar particle. Okay. So this is a, a nice figure that yeah, one of my students had made. So I like to show it, although I have said it, but I'll still show the diagram because it looks nice. So if we have a pion and, and, I, and I do the axial transformation on the, on, on, on the quarks, then I get a sigma particle and, and vice versa. If I had a sigma and I do the chiral transformation there, I will get a pion. Okay, there will be a mixture depending upon how much angle you choose, it can completely be transformed into this and row to A1 and back. Now, if we look at the structure of what we see in, in experiment, you see there are 
there are particles which are a1 rho sigma and pi one has to keep in mind that sigma not really has entirely a quark anti quark uh, bound state because we don't know exactly the complete internal structure of this but i'm imagining that so far i can take it as effectively quark anti quark states all of them so what we see is that the mass of the pi n lies somewhere here mass of the sigma is here mass of the rho is here and the mass of the a1 is here now if chiral symmetry was an exact symmetry what will happen it means that you will rotate and the mass of the particles shouldn't change it gets changed to a different mass because this is not observed the symmetry so at the level of the spectrum of particles you see that this symmetry is broken okay and when you try to look at the mass differences between those two you say this so no, they're of the order of about a few hundred MeVs. Isn't that the same as the dynamical mass, which probably is generated for quarks and uh, down quarks and up quarks? Okay, let's say, uh, uh, you know, this is you just thought provoking questions. Then you go to the nucleon and it's, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and it's excited states. You see the nucleon has parity positive. So it's a, uh, parity opposite state for which the axial rotations which take pi to sigma to the opposite parity states the closest opposite parity states to nucleon which is n 940 is 1535 these are the things which are measured here in jefferson lab and these transition from nucleon going to these and form factors are also measured in j lab this is also seems to be of the order of 600 mev the difference between nucleon and its first parity partner it's, it's, it's what we can call parity partner, the lowest lying opposite parity state. Then we go to the deltas. So that delta that we know three by two plus is 1232. And the first opposite parity state, which conserves the spin of it is three and it's 1700. And the difference is again of the order of 500 MeV. So you see that you can see that probably there is a connection why there is each time the mass between opposite parity state is of, of of the same same size okay so um so i will uh, leave this question here to ponder but then i come back to the gap equation that we have in qcd and then study and then afterwards make the connection back to these differences of masses so uh, we look at the Schrodinger dyson equation of the cock propagator but now i'm not going to solve it in its full glory because that's you know, with all the symmetries and complicated stuff, no time, no energy, not for this lecture. Okay. So first I'm going to start like we did the Medansky scaling law, something very simple that you can go home and do it in one hour. Okay. But I'll see that still it, it, it's, uh, it's really very illustrative how, how, how we will solve it in one of the simplest approximation, this, this gap equation. So this, this propagator inverse for the quark, I can write as I gamma dot P plus mass of the fermion and the, uh, um, what we have in the Lagrangian. And this is the self energy written almost exactly the way it is written for QED. The only thing is that here, this is the quark gluon vertex. I'm not showing explicitly the color indices, but, but this is the quark gluon vertex. So one, one of the interesting thing, there have been debates since, uh, early, um, how do you say, this is about 25 years ago. How does the gluon propagator behaves in the infrared? There are people who work using renormalization group equation, Schwinger dyson equation, um, lattice. And I remember a long time ago, 2008, I attended a, a conference in Mainz, which was on confinement. And uh, there was actually a, um, a Brazilian scientist, Teresa Mendes. She was sitting beside me. I didn't know who she was. And there was an Austrian physicist talking about uh, uh, giving a seminar, talking about how gluon can behave in the infrared and how, um, how the QCD, uh, how the uh, lattice studies support what he's saying. And she stands up in a complete fury and says, you are absolutely wrong. Our lattice studies do not support what you're saying. We are finding a different solution for the gluon propagator in the infrared. And that corresponds to the fact that gluon probably has a mass in the infrared. Okay. And those were debates in 2007 and eight were, were pretty furious in, among different groups. 
And, and, uh, and then she finishes that. And because I was not introduced, she was just sitting beside me. She said, by the way, I'm Teresa Mendes. I'm usually not like this. <laughs> okay. So that was my, my first introduction with her. But after about 15, 16, 20 years, uh, most of the groups have come to the conclusions from different studies that this mass, uh, this gluon uh, generates an effective mass scale in the infrared that corresponds to the saturation of the gluon propagator in the infrared. These studies have been carried out in, in Lando gauge, in other gauges up till Feynman gauge, uh, lattice calculations, Schwinger Dyson equation, renormalization group. What is it called? Uh, the um, Grebo, what? Uh, Swansinger uh, extended Grebo Swansinger model uh, uh, developed all indicate that gluons seem to have uh, a, an effective mass scale in the infrared. And guess what? It is of the order of 500 MeV. So this 500 MeVs are just uh, always, always, always around there. This was in fact one of the first predictions of uh, of um, was it uh, in 1982? It was uh, not it was uh, Cornwall. Cornwall, uh, Cornwall, in one of his famous papers, he talked about a gluon mass scale of about 350 MeVs in the infrared. Anyway, um, so, um, so this is the equation, and I'm going to try to uh, make a model so simple that we can do it in the classroom or, or, or at home to start with, of course, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, there will be this G square coming here, and there will be a G square or four pi, uh, which uh, I call this, this thing alpha, and alpha is nothing uh, but like G square over four pi. And uh, um, I will, you know, this uh, gluon propagator, which is D mu nu, you, you have this, you know, Lorentz structure, but instead of calling it any Lorentz structure, I will say that this is simply a constant. Okay. Simply a constant means that this gluon, something like it's so heavy that it doesn't move so much. And it's like a, like a contact interaction, like the number general senior model. It's a point interaction. But I know that the gluon propagator has a one over mass, one over k squared mass scale, but that one over k square I will associate with the mass scale that people tell me that the gluon has in the infrared. So if they tell me that in the infrared, the scale is about 500 MeV, I just put it 500 MeV because that's what they're telling me. And I see it doesn't run. That is just constant 500 MeV. And I take it as alpha over mg squared instead of one over k squared. Because what I'm, I'm interested in this moment is to study QCD in the infrared, not what is it in the, in the perturbative limit. I'll come back to uh, of it in perturbative limit at, at a later stage. And I will use the vertex as the bare vertex that I we took for QED to start with. Now we have this 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 constant gluon propagator. Okay, this constant probate with a mass scale of of 500 MeV associated. This again I can write in the most general fashion the quark propagator, which can be written. I wrote it previously in terms of A and V. I just keep changing notations. So please don't don't mind it so much. And then you will see that there are two equations again. One of the equations is, uh, is, uh, is one. There is not even a Lando gauge now because I'm not talking about gauges. I'm talking about this effective uh, gluon propagator. So this is, this is what you find. Again, what you can see is that the structure is simple. You can do the calculation. And if there was no bare mass here, there is always a solution which is sustained in perturbation theory. That if you start from a bare mass equal to zero, then it will not be generated at any other order in QCD. And that is a fact of QCD. This interaction needs to be regularized for its divergence. But one of the problem is I was telling you that quantum electrodynamics or QCD or weak interactions are all renormalizable. But this one is not. This is a four fermion interaction now because I've taken it as a point interaction and those are not renormalizable. So I can regularize it, but I can't renormalize it because it won't be renormalizable. So I, I, I put a lambda scale here to regularize it, but I can't take it off to infinity because it will all this divergence, I can never uh, do anything with it. So one of the solutions of this equations, if I put the small m equal to zero, is this Wigner mode, which is the Carl's equation. 
Let me start with put this alpha infrared equal to one, because I know that around one, you can have probably a non perturbative solution coming in. QED told me that there was a non perturbative solution when alpha was pi over three, around one. Let me put it around of the order of one. The only thing is you have to keep in mind that there is an effective coupling here, which is not just this, but this divided by mg square. You can see that this they come together, so I can't really distinguish between two. So the effective coupling here is not just this scale, but this divided by mg squared. So if I do that and simply go ahead and solve this equation, it can, this integration can be done. I can't remove lambda, there is lambda, and this is the solution that, that I find. This is a solution different from MF equal to zero, which is a non-perturbative solution, different from the Wigner mode solution. Okay, what other thing I will do is only to start with, I'll put this lambda equal to one GeV. One GeV is roughly about the hadronic scale. The mass of the proton is of the order of one GeV, 940 MeV. So, so you know, I can go uh, to momentum scale where I'm able to form hadrons. So I put it equal to one GV and, and see what it is. Now you can see that this quantity, which is this DFM function, I'm calling this, and I look at the structure of, 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 of what, what is this, what is this function? You know, you can uh, uh, go home and draw it on your, on your Mathematica thing. This function has a maximum value one at M equal to zero, and it is a monotonically decreasing function of M. So if I, you know, I was sitting at home, I draw this function here. There is not X. This is the dynamical mass for the for the quark. It's X and X. I draw it as a function of X, and I find that its maximum value at one, and then it is monotonically decreasing. What does it tell me? It tells me that this, if this solution has to exist, and if it is only either one or less than one, but the left side is one, therefore. 3 pi mg square over 4 should have a maximum value at 1. Okay. So this has to be equal or less than 1 for this equality to hold true. This gives me a limit on the gluon mass scale. So I try to see what is this. But remember, I had put lambda equal to 1 for the, you know, for the sake of simplicity. But that's why there is a mismatch of dimensions on both sides. If I had kept my lambda squared, the relation should be like that. Now, if I put again back lambda equal to one GeV and solve it, it tells me that the mass of the gluon or the length scale of the gluon has to be about less than 650 MeVs. So it's, it seems that it's plausible. You know, there is a solution that I can get for a gluon mass scale, which is 500 MeV, which is allowing me a solution which is different from what I see in perturbation theory. Okay. These are, these are trickeries. Now I, I put the value Mg is 500 MeV. And I draw MF as a function of MG. Now, go and look, look, let's go back and see the equation. You see, uh, whatever appears here is an effective coupling scale, okay? That coupling scale means that if I put MG smaller and smaller, sorry, if MG becomes bigger and bigger, this effective coupling which is here becomes smaller and smaller. So by increasing the gluon mass, I'm reducing the coupling which exists between the quarks and gluons. Okay. Now that keeping in, that in mind, if you go back and, and look at the graph that I, I draw this as a function of gluon mass scale, I say that when the gluon masses are small, there is an effective mass for the fermion. But when I keep increasing the gluon mass, the effective coupling becomes smaller and smaller, and there is a critical coupling below which then there is no mass. And you have exactly the same solution that you have in perturbation theory. This is very similar to what you do for QED. I haven't actually, I do this graph only a few days ago. I didn't check is it follows, it seems like following very much close to a Miransky scaling law, but I haven't checked if it is the same or not. This is a solution which you never find in QCD, full QCD. Because in full QCD, in perturbation theory, your mass function for the quark is always proportional to M, and then the perturbative corrections are always proportional to M, and there are logarithms here. And when you take this limit from going to zero, this M is always zero. And this is different from the solution that we can possibly get in, in non-perturbative dynamics. 
Now there is, uh, you know, we will not use the cutoff uh, regularization. We use slightly different in this model. This is called the contact interaction model. We use what is called the proper time regularization. Uh, it's, you know, you don't have to worry a, a lot about it. This denominator, we change it to a different denominator where we have this ultraviolet and infrared both scales. And if you solve this, this, this integral, you will feel that instead of this, we will use, use this thing. We only had the ultraviolet because we only have the ultraviolet divergence, but we also put an infrared regulator. And the reason we put an infrared regulator that it becomes slightly, slightly interesting in the sense that, uh, that uh, um, how, how does it how does it work? Huh? Um, that when you have s equal to uh, minus m f squared, you know that uh, if we had if we, there was nothing on top, if it was one of this, this has a pole in the propagator. Okay, but we know that usually, you know, we were saying that particles which have poles should be able to reach the detector. Um, but we don't want to have this, and we see that if we put an infrared uh, cutoff as well, then if you put S equal to minus MF square, there would also be a pole on the top. And that cancels with one which is lower, and this avoids having a pole. You know, it's a slight detail to make it look nicer. Let's say, hey, it's a confined particle. It's not really a thing, but, you know, you can roughly say that it is, it is that. So it's not renormalizable. So this ultraviolet kind of, you can't remove it. It will always be there for this particular model. So uh, this equation can actually be solved uh, not as, uh, as, as simply as our, our analytical result, but again, this can be solved. You again have a constant uh, mass here for MF and uh, instead of those logs and something, there, this is called the incomplete gamma function, but you can numerically solve it. And if you use uh, these values for the parameters which, which appear here, like this, you know, the mass of the up and or the down quark will take about seven MeVs, not different from what we have in reality. This infrared cutoff is about 240 MeV, which is something like the confinement uh, scale, lambda QCD. Ultraviolet cutoff we'll use, okay, it's a hadronic mass, 900 MeVs, like the proton neutron not so bad. Alpha is 0.36 times pi. How much is that? It's about one, okay? Where we have this non perturbative effects coming in uh, alpha large. And when we do this and solve this, we find that the up quark mass, MF, we got it, we got it 367 MeVs. Right? This is again, all scales seem to be a few hundred MeVs. Gluon, fermion, the difference between opposite parity bound states all of the same few hundred MeV. So it's, it sounds interesting. Okay. Now we can also go on to solve what is called the beta salpeter uh, equation, which is for the bound state, but I'm not going to do it because uh, there is no time. And, 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 and if you have your hair, you can always, you know, I can show you the notes where you can do it. But in this particular model, this also is something that you can do it by hand in a few hours if you, so beta salpeter equation is, is, is the equation of bound state of two particles. So if it is uh, of any bound state of a quark and an anti-quark, this quark and an anti-quark can interact with each other through any kind of kernel or interactions which are taking place between them. And we can use the propagator that we have just calculated. We can just use the gluon propagator we have just. So here we can replace the gluon propagator and solve it. And then in the most general form, remember we say that quark propagator in the most general form has two unknown functions. The gluon propagator or photon propagator has most general form just one because the longitudinal part doesn't get modified. The full quark gluon vertex, so the full electron photon vertex can be written in terms of 12 unknown functions. The beta salpeter amplitude, the best we can do is just write in terms of all possible unknown functions that we can and see if we can solve it simultaneously. And in this particular model, it can be written in terms of only two structures, which is gamma five and gamma five times p slash. And p slash is the is the is the pion momentum. This is the reduced mass of uh, of the quark and an anti quark, and and this is the beta salpeter equation written in terms of whatever Feynman rules you can say. Okay, and then 
you can solve it. And I'm not going through the solutions of this, but you can eventually study this physical process in which this photon is probing a pion and telling me about the pion form factor. So there's a pion which comes in, but this photon interacts with the quark, okay? And leaves the pion intact. And in the final state, we again have the same pion. So it tells me the pion form factor. And I define the pion form factor depending upon this photon is, is interacting with one type of quark or another type of quark. Either if it's a UD bar, which is usually the pi plus, which we have at JLab, is that either it can interact with the up quark or the D bar quark, this photon. So there'll be two diagrams and then you can sum them up to calculate the total uh, uh, pion form factor. So here I use the solutions that I had this for very simple model. Using the same model, I use calculate the beta saltpeter amplitudes. I put them think these things together. I use the Bayer verdicts for it, and I calculate the form factors and compare it with the experimental values that they have it in, in JLab, where I told you that before the 12 GV upgrade, they could measure it up to about 2.5 G. So I do this and I, you know, I, I allow a bit of a variation of my parameters to make sure that the charge radius, this is a pion is, is, not, is not fixed. It can vary a little bit, but I can't make it go completely out of the reasonable values and, and the pion decay constant and the condensate. So I allow the experimental results, especially for the pion decay constants and the condensate that we have that a bit of a variation of the parameters that I said, I'll take 0 0.905 here and point this there. So I can vary this and, and still within the range of the experimental results that I know for the decay constant of pion and the quark condensate. And this is the form factor that I get, not too bad. Not too bad, but not too good as well, because even at 2.5, it is not so good. But the model was so simple that you can really go home and do these calculations home in a few hours. And that's uh, that, that's uh, that's that's quite nice. And you can, you know, of course, you can calculate the charge radius of the pion. It's about how much the charge extent is is there inside inside the pion. You can, in fact, use this model to calculate the form factors for any pseudoscalar meson, any vector meson, any axial vector meson, and that's what we have done. You can calculate for baryons, any kind of baryons, heavy, light baryons. You will get, of course, not completely right results, but you can get results for all of them because it is very simple. Okay. In fact, you can also do the Keon form factor. Keon uh, form factor has only been measured till 0.125 GV squared. In fact, only now uh, they are already, um, how do you say, analyzing the data in Jefferson Lab. They have measured the Keon form factor till 5 GV squared, but the data is being analyzed and there is preliminary results available, but I've not yet compared it now with this model, but I'll present it tomorrow. So uh, there is so much error so far that, you know, you can't say much, you know, uh, so you can have a pretty bad model, but still more or less it will pass through the results. Okay. Now, it's one of the one of articles that I wrote my, my, my PhD student, Melanie, and, and, and others are there. This year, we published it. Using the simple model, we can actually calculate the charge radii of, of all the pseudoscalar mesons. Uh, we are certain, see a certain kind of uh, hierarchy there. Uh, of course, whether lattice or experimental results are only known, say, for pion and kaon. Our model is, is, is bad. Uh, and that's why we get the bad, bad slope. And our results, even for charge radii, we know that about 20% uh, generally less than what the lattice values are or what are the results which we get from experiment. But we understand it. It's not bad because the model is, is. But at least what we can have, we can make predictions for all other bound states of heavy, heavy mesons as well. And what we see is that wherever the results are known with sophisticated method, our results are bad and underestimated by about 20%. So we can say, hmm, if probably somebody will go ahead and do a good calculation, just increase it by 20%, you'll probably get the right result. You know, So you can make somehow uh, a, a rough back of the envelope uh, predictions. But then how much time is left? Yeah. 20 minutes, 25 minutes.
Okay, I will let you. Wait a minute, I spoke a lot. Okay. She's a good. Anyway, I don't have more than five minutes, 10 minutes to speak. Right? So let's look at the Schwinger Dyson equations of QCD. So this is for the, for the uh, quark propagator. And I first put it here for the ghost propagator because there was only space available for me to do a simple, write a simple one. So for the ghost propagator, it couples to the gluon propagator. This is the Schwinger Dyson equation. Then we have for the gluon propagator, it looks so different from the photon propagator. The photon propagator had just this diagram plus this diagram for the fermions. Now there are ghosts, there are self interactions of gluon coming all over the place. Now, how we are going to solve it non perturbatively it's a complicated thing to do. Okay, so these are complicated equations for, for QCD, and that's why that's a homework for you guys. <laughs> and then we look at the quark gluon vertex, and you see this is the quark gluon vertex equation, which is also very complicated. I wouldn't even bother over explaining what these blobs are, which are shaded blobs and non shaded blobs, or which are one particle irreducible quantities and which part one particle is reducible. So this is the, the ghost gluon vertex has its own equation and then it keeps keeps going on. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, I think uh, Lupita was asking me this, the, the, this question, why do we solve it for renormalized quantities? In fact, what you have to do is you write this equation to start with for the bare quantities, okay? But then to solve it, uh, the best thing is you put it here already, the renormalized quantities, because you don't have divergences that anymore. And you use these relationship, which you have for QCD renormalization functions. I had shown you these relations for QED, but not for QCD. These are the relations which are for QCD. And now I don't even remember, for example, what is this Z5? I think it's probably the renormalization constant for the ghost gluon vertex. I don't know which one is about. You know, you can look at Mutha's book and you'll find an introduction to QCD, what each of these are. So you can write these, these equations in, in, in different ways. I can, either you can write it in terms of uh, the renormalization functions which appear in the quark sector, quark loan sector, or you can use this relationship and write the same equation in, in terms of, of uh, renormalized constant which appear in the ghost gluon sector. You, you can do both the things. But at the end of the day, that you have these equa this equation, and then you have to solve it simultaneously for the functions which appear in the quark propagator, but also at the same time for the renormalization constants, because these constants are not going to be the ones which are there in perturbation theory, but they will be a non-perturbative solution for these renormalization constants also. The only thing is that in the limit of perturbation theory, weak coupling limit, it should reproduce perturbative limit. Now, at the moment, I'm not going to solve it, how you do it, but you, of course, truncate your solutions. You use a vertex, you use a gluon propagator, uh, you give enough infrared strength to this. I'll probably talk about it, it, it tomorrow. And you make the best input to get your chiral condense, quark condensate right, and you get the right pion decay constants. Once you do this, then you can see that at least pion, almost all other details become almost irrelevant. It doesn't matter what else. As long as produces chiral quark condensate and pion decay constant correctly, all the rest for pion comes out okay. okay. And that's what you get. If your chiral condensate is right for almost any answer that you make, if your pion decay constant is what experimental value gives you, this is what you get for the mass function of the quark. Okay. So uh, answering, answering your question, we're talking about explicit color symmetry breaking and, and, and dynamical color symmetry. So there is, you know, if you look at the real up and down quark masses in the, in the standard model, then you'll see in the Lagrangian, there are about three or four MeVs. Here again, I'm talking about this uh, isospin symmetry in which I assume that up and down quark uh, masses are small, I assume, and I hope the down quark mass is slightly more than up. Uh, so, so this is what comes from the Higgs mechanism, this 3.74 MeV. Okay. Now you use your QCD 
strong enough interaction to produce your chiral quark condensate and F pi, what you observe in experiment. And you see that your mass function will depend upon a momentum scale. And for infrared momentum, it will reach of the order of a few hundred MeV. Okay. So the mass that you will observe that is called the dressed mass will be a few hundred MeV and that is generated by the, by the, um, by the QCD interactions. But the Higgs mechanism is this. Well, when you go to heavier mesons, you can see that there is not much of a difference between the mass which is there in the Lagrangian and the mass which is given to by the QCD interaction. Okay? But in fact, you should remember that QCD interactions are, are, are flavor blind. Okay? So if you look at the details, in fact, the dynamical mass is given to all of these quarks is the same. It's about 300 MeVs. The only thing is that here it looks very small because there is explicit mass was so huge. It was 4.18 GeV. And if you add 300 MeV, it doesn't make a lot of difference. So it, it, it shows a very little, little difference here. But the interesting thing is that if you had started from your Lagrangian, in which there was no original mass in the Lagrangian, somehow these equations still generate the mass for the up and down quarks. And it is almost of the same, same order as if there was Higgs present mechanism or Higgs is not present, it becomes irrelevant. Okay. So the mass which is generated by QCD interactions is a lot larger, about 98% or 99% of the mass which is dynamically generated for these quarks is, is coming from the interactions of QCD rather than the mechanism, the, 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 the Higgs mechanism. Okay. Um, so, so that's, uh, I was saying that hopefully that the down quark mass is a bit more than up quark. Do you know why is it so? Why do we know that down quark should be a bit, what happens if a quark, up quark mass is a bit bigger than down quark? <laughs> yes, we won't be here. Why won't we be here? Yeah, proton will be more massive than, than, than the neutron. So we, and the neutron has two down quark masses and proton has two up quark masses. We have the down quark mass. So, so we owe it a bit to a Higgs, which presumably is giving a bit more initial quark because QCD interactions are flavor blind, okay? So Higgs mechanism should be uh, coupling to down quark a bit more to get it more mass for us to be stable. Yeah, this calculation for that. Right. This is this is for isospin sym symmetry. That is that I take U and D masses to be the same, but I could make them different as well. Yeah. There is SU two symmetry is there. SU three right. is also can be there, but it is you know, less exact. Yeah. I mean, I also do it for the strange quark. I have the strange quark as well. I mean, I'm not starting with any symmetry here. I'm taking in the Lagrangian all the quarks and their initial masses. Here, I'm not using any. any. The only thing I'm assuming is that up and down quarks are almost the same mass. That's all. But yeah, there is a strange quark mass with 95 or maybe here. There's a charm quark mass, quark. So even when you say that, even if I started with massless phase, it would still. Because the solution does give it. When you, why does it? Oh, th that is th that is exactly what I was talking to. That's the dynamical breakdown of chiral symmetry. Uh, that is what takes place because QCD interactions are strong enough to generate a mass scale not necessarily given to us by Higgs mechanism. That's what lambda QCD is. That has nothing to do with Higgs mechanism. QCD interactions are the only interactions which are strong enough in the infrared to generate their own mass scale independently of the Higgs mechanism. And that breaks the uh, simplicity of the vacuum, creates a condensate for quark anti-quark condensate, and that is what gives the masses instead of the Higgs. So for generating this mass, we don't require a Higgs condensate. We require the psi bar psi condensate. Very interesting. So, um... Um, is this something that I thought about with 
So if you have like an electromagnetic bond state um, where there is like positive and a negative charge in the original bond state, um, the mass of the bond state um, would have lesser mass than the individual, um, for example, electron and proton, hydrogen atom would have a lower mass as compared to the masses of both of them added together because of uh, the interaction, um, whatever binding energy. But in case of a proton, uh, the mass. If we had assumed U quark as pi m and U quark is, and you add it, the mass is more than the bound state is more than the mass of the individual. But then from your um, lecture, what I see is that in case um, in in a, in a bound state, the mass is not pi m but there is this dynamical mass generation. Um, but when you add those masses, do you see that kind of an effect? Because well, time. you have so many classical arguments. So really, you know, in terms of strong interactions, it's 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 very hard to extend the argument that you're giving. But yeah, uh, what one can see is that the interactions are so strong that that the effective masses or the or the dressed masses uh, become large. But then they are also glue on and 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 expectedly their masses here. Uh, in this kind of view, generally what people try to do what we try to do is explain the non perturbative part only in terms of the of the dressed quark dressed quark valence quark masses and not dressed quark you know the the constituent mass or, or dressed masses are the masses which appear uh, uh, through the qcd interactions okay so uh, so the the way we visualize it is that if if the gluon acquires masses of 500 mev and if a quark you know um, is is going through a medium, gluons around it, 500 MeVs. That gluons transfers its mass to the to to the quarks, which come of that. So yeah. Uh, in fact, there is a uh, uh, there was a, a little you know coming back to quantum electrodynamics. There's a there's a little you know we have a state positronium state electron positron, but. Uh, um, Imagine if we were living in a QED with a coupling very large, more than one, there was a likelihood that there would be another state of positron and electron, which would be a strongly bound state uh, uh, because that can, can break the vacuum as well because we know that there are new solutions which come for QED. Some people, I think, at some point were looking for this in, in, um, in collision of ions or um, which have nu nuclei, uh, uh, which have so many protons uh, that uh, when you put together the, the number of protons in, 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 in this ion and this ion, and when you put together, it's more than 140 or 50. So the effective charge will probably be 1 over 137 multiplied by a big number. And, and if you see if you can see such bound states or not. Yes. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, am I done? I don't know. Because you were asking me to be done. Yeah. No? I think I'm done. Um, it's just what next. So, uh, so, so tomorrow in the last one, I will actually do no calculation at all. So I'll just be flashing you results with the full thing. So what is the current state of some modern results for the pattern observables through this time of calculations? We'll show you the results for the form factors. Uh, some for the GPDs, the distribution amplitudes of, of mesons, the PDFs, et cetera. And of course, can we strike a balance between the complexity of the hadron physics study through SDEs and aims of the theoretical and experimental program? You know, there are two directions in which we try to go. In fact, three, three directions. One is to make advances in the theoretical side of understanding this because non perturbative study of field theories. Uh, um, um, is not as straightforward and simple as perturbation theory where all the symmetries are conserved. So, so study the theoretical structure of these equations is important and that's what highlighted in the first lecture of today. And But on the other hand, to make connection with physical observable, we cannot wait to be able to solve it completely correctly and do it 20 years and then be able to see. So at the same time, we also use what is whatever we have currently available and, and try to make make uh, prediction for physical observable, and then gradually with the combined aspects of both of this to keep improving upon this work and try to see 
uh, that that we achieve some sort of robustness or the predictions which we can say it should probably be uh, uh, um, be as correct as possible. As for as pseudoscalar mesons and vector mesons are concerned, I can say that I think our predictions uh, of these formalisms are, are very, very robust, so much so that I think we are even able to make very precise uh, predictions for the contribution that come from the pions or, or or the uh, or the kaons or other pseudoscalar mesons for the uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which is a very precise quantity, and I think that our predictions have the same kind of precision level as any any other studies. But when it comes, of course, to um, axial vector mesons or scalar mesons or baryons, for baryons it becomes uh, a bit more complicated because those are not easy to study. But we have started to make progress in that direction as well. Yeah, that's where I stopped.